fabulous. I believe we are live. Uh, welcome everybody, um, everybody in the room and everybody who might be joining us from the, the live stream to Muslims in the Margins, a joyful panel on underrepresented perspectives put together by RT Ishaq. Thank you so much for having me here, RT. Um, I'm going to go ahead and dive right in. We are waiting on a few artists to join us, and hopefully they'll they'll make their way in as we um, get through our intros here. Um, so my name is Tasneem Manviwala. I'm coming to you from, um, I, I'm between Chicago and Houston. I'm a cultural psychologist, intersectional feminist, activist, educator, writer, and visual artist. Um, but I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement in terms of where I'm speaking to you from and where a few of us are, are joining you from today. Um, I respectfully recognize that as we come together today, I speak to you from land that the Potawatomi, Miami, Peoria, Sioux, and Kickapoo people have stewarded throughout the generations. This is the land that we call home and on which we create art. We acknowledge that we are on occupied land that was forcibly taken from its original owners, and we affirm that while we cannot change history, we can work for justice and that justice begins with recognition and acknowledgement. So the purpose of coming together today is to dispel the myth of a single story by sharing our own stories as Muslim artists and to identify opportunities for growth within institutions and the industry at large um, to incorporate more nuanced and varied Muslim stories. Um, and I'm so excited for all of you to be joining together in this space today uh, because all of the amazing artists present uh, contribute in just unspeakably, unspeakably rich ways. So what I'd like to do now is go around to our Zoom room. I'm going to call on the artists in the appear in excuse me in the order they appear on my screen, um, and I'd like to ask each person to please introduce themselves briefly, briefly to the group. Um, so, in fact, RT, you are first up on my screen, so I'll hand it over to you. Hi, everybody. My name is RT Estak. My pronouns are they them. Um, I'm also residing in Chicago, the traditional homelands of the Council of Three Fires. Um, I'm an actor, director, writer, filmmaker, um, originally from Detroit. I also am a program manager at the Chicago Inclusion Project, an instructor at Black Box Acting, and an organizer with our host organization, Swanasa Central. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Archie. Welcome. Uh, Hamad, you're up next. Sure. Um... My name is Hamad Jodri. I am a playwright and a screenwriter. Uh, I usually base myself between both the UK and the US, but currently speaking to you from London. Wonderful. Thank you, Hamad. Nadia, you're next. Hi, my name is Nadia Noman. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. I am also based in Chicago. I'm a, a writer, actor, director, etc. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Ayuza, you're next. And please let me know if I'm uh, pronouncing your name correctly or not at oh, all. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Aiza Fatima. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am based in New York City, also known as the land of the Lenape people. Um, I am a writer, actor, producer, director, filmmaker. Um, like all of us, I wear many, many hats. Um, I started off in theater, uh, turned my play into a feature film that we recently sold to Sony, which I'm super excited for the world to see soon. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Welcome. Hey, Hannah. Hi, um, I'm Rahana Lou Mirza, pronoun she, her. I reside uh, generally in Brooklyn, New York, uh, land of the Lenape. And uh, uh, sometimes I'm in Chicago. I got to see Artie's work as a director because uh, she directed my play, which is up out there right now. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and last but not least for now, Kareem, you're up. Hi, everyone. Uh, Kareem Fahmy. I uh, am based and reside in New York in Harlem, and I'm currently Zooming into you from uh, Glencoe, Illinois, um, where I'm uh, directing. Uh, I'm a director and a playwright and a screenwriter, and I'm, I'm here in Glencoe directing my play, uh, which is playing right across the street from where I'm sitting at Writers Theater, um, so in rehearsals now. Happy to be here. 
Great, thank you for being here. Um, and I'd also like to give a nod to uh, Sister Mona, who is our ASL interpreter um, and making this accessible for, for more folks in the future. So thank you, and, and currently. Um, Wonderful. Um, so before we dive into our conversation today, I did want to flag that in the HowlRound live stream, you should be able to submit your questions as audience members if you are joining us today. So please feel free to type those up as you as they come to you throughout the conversation, and we will be reserving some time at the at the end to, to address as many of those as as possible. So. Um, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, so the first question, uh, it's again, open open to the group. Please feel free to just raise your Zoom hands um, as you feel inspired to answer. Um, the first question is, how does your art making center Muslim representation? And then perhaps just as importantly, how does it not? I can go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I think I was making art about being Muslim when it was very uncool to do that in like 2009, 2010. Um, and it was sort of by accident. I did, uh, I wrote a one person play that was all about the Muslim identity. And I remember when I first performed it in 2011, 2000, yeah, when was this? Yeah, 2011. A lot of the press around it was, um, for the first time ever, American Muslim like stories on a New York stage. And, and it was very scandalous in a lot of ways um, for the Muslim community, because some people were like, how dare you talk about very personal intimate details of like women dating women and and you know 2023 i've since then made that show into a film uh the play was called dirty packy lingerie it's a comedy and the feature film is a rom-com it's called americanish and to this day i've had muslim people even in the film um you know being offended by some of the realities of muslim female life that we're depicting in this um, so, yeah, so I guess it's my work has kind of always centered Muslim voices, um, and I kind of continue to do, do that. I I feel like back then there was nobody, like the only representation of Muslims we saw in the media was like a dude with a beard and a sword going Allahu Akbar, you know, and people just thought that was Muslim. So for me, it was an act of activism to be like, this is what I look like. And I have a full-time job working in tech at Google at the moment. And this is Muslim also. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's evolved over the years from just like that Muslim story for me to being like just looking around and being like, well, who else is underrepresented and not at the table and who can I give a seat to at that table? So as I've kind of evolved, you know, I'm like very kind of thinking really deeper about the voices I'm able to bring to the table, even within the Muslim community that are very marginalized and that's Black Muslims, you know who are looked down upon within our own community. We know this from going to our own mosques and our own, uh, you know, gatherings, um, Hispanic Muslims and others. And I think the voices that often get highlighted are the South Asian and the Arab Muslim voices are the ones that we hear or see um, in the media. So just kind of thinking a little, or queer voices, you know, there are some now or LGBTQ in general, um, but just being more kind of, um, you know, in my unprivileged privilege, <laughs> <laughs> who else can I bring to the table that is even like more unprivileged than I am? So those that's kind of like what I'm thinking about these days as I'm making art. Thank you so much, Aiza. Um, just a, qu a quick reminder to please uh, use the Zoom hand feature. Nadia, thank you for your patience. For sure. Um, so I think I uh, work a lot in new play development, and uh, I love working with Muslim playwrights who are developing work that um, are contributing to the canon. Um, and it's really fun to be able to bring like fresh perspectives to the stage. Um, and in my own work, um, primarily as a filmmaker, I love uh, making films about young queer Muslims who are trying to figure out how to be in a world that doesn't really make sense to them. And I bring a lot of fantastical elements to that. So in providing space to uh, for stories for 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 queer, queer Muslims to be uh, on film, I'm also um, 
making stories that have fantastical elements that don't necessarily have to be Muslim specific. Um, so it's nice to be able to um, not only tell a story that is specific to me, but also that can be seen and consumed by folks from whatever background you come from. Thanks, Nadia. Rihanna, go ahead. Thanks. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think for me, how my work uh, is Muslim or is it Muslim, it's, a, it's really just a response to the world around me. Um, and when I first started writing, this is going to date me, but like I should, if I did smoke, I would smoke, start a cigarette right now. <laughs> well, back in my day. But uh, it was the first play I ever wrote was literally just a personal response to the world. And because I saw the world through this certain lens, it became very Muslim in that way, but it also didn't sometimes. So like uh, the first play I wrote was Barriers and it was uh, based on me and my sister living together downtown and 9-11 uh, had happened and I was at work uptown and she was uh, still ostensibly at our apartment, but I couldn't get through because of the phone line. So as I was running home to try to find her and on Times Square, they had like the news footage and I was like, saw that. And I was just like, gotta go, gotta go, gotta keep going. And a woman was like, foreigners, you did this and spat on me. And I was like, it's cool, I got spit on me, but I'm gonna go check up on my sister and it's gonna be okay. And I think a lot of my perspective as a writer got shaped by that moment. And, you know, as my sister and I were trying to process, like, who are we? We're like 20 somethings living together and, you know, don't know what we're doing. We actually found um, a missing flyer with a woman, a brown woman, and her eyes were burnt out, the cigarette holder. And we were like, okay, we're like grieving this incident, but people who look like us are being um, maligned, obviously. And so from there on, that kind of absurdity, that juxtaposition of like, this is who we are, but the world is acting like this. And isn't this kind of crazy, everyone? Has kind of really defined my work. Um, and so in that way, it is Muslim. And in another way, it's really not Muslim. And so trying to navigate that is sort of my sweet spot. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry that happened to you, by the way. Um, My Spider-Man oh. story. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Come on, go ahead. Thank you. Um, for myself, uh, essentially, I feel like I'm a self-exploratory writer. Uh, I like to explore my own experiences, make sense of them, extract meaning from them. And so much of my experiences are to do with being Muslim, as a Muslim myself. So through that, I have uh, inevitably centered Muslim narratives and centered Muslim representation. Uh, perhaps what I have not done that is that I've never really conducted any sort of field research and tried to represent uh, 1.7 billion Muslim narratives. It's really uh, a single story that I'm telling, and it's not every Muslim's story. Yes, could you, could I actually ask you a follow-up to that, Hamad? Where can you say more about being seen as a, as a representative for a global population that contains an immense degree of variety? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? Um, <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> you know, it's like, who, me? <laughs> I just wrote a play. Um, so yeah, it, I think it's a huge responsibility that can be uh, imposed on someone. Some people do a great job, artists, academics, scholars, public intellectuals. They do a great, great job about, of telling stories about Muslims and representing the Muslim narrative as widely as possible. Um, I've never wanted to be a spokesperson and I've never wanted that pressure or responsibility. I just wanted to be a, a writer, an artist, uh, and I've never acted or pretended to take that responsibility on. But it is true, um, coming back to your question, people do want you to be uh, the voice of a particular community, which is, uh, which is troubling on many levels. One, because it's just not a homogenous community. 
Um, you know, and I don't think the solution is having one voice or two voices. I think do think the solution is recognizing how diverse this community is and or then representing the as many narratives, as various narratives of Muslims as possible, and not just having a single spokesperson. Um, I don't think that can happen. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think that's why a space like this is so, so critical. Um, I just want to also make a quick note that if any any of you all want to respond to each other's comments, feel free to please um, chime in. Um, Kareem, go ahead. You know, it's interesting because when I first started writing Muslim stories, I think I was actually doing it a little bit out of a response for having seen how how it goes or what the effect is when non-Muslim people are at the heart of telling a story, which is Muslim, right? And I, because I came to New York also to date myself, Rahana, you know, probably met you way back then, but like, you know, it was just a couple of years after 9-11 and there was, a, you know, certainly a, a, a lot of interest in like, well, how are we going to talk about Islam in America, right? And a lot of the stuff that I was seeing was actually, I think, harmful. Like, I actually say it sort of caused harm, right? Um, and, but I, I, you know, like many Muslims, you know, I think had a lot of personal feelings about, you know, how, how kind of like what Hamad was saying, it's like, it's not my job to represent, you know, a billion plus people on the planet. Like, how do I do that, right? But I think at a certain point, I was like, well, if I don't do this, then I am continuing to not offer that other perspective that I think was so vital because of the fact that the perspectives I was seeing were largely skewed, you know? So, and it's been, I mean, even though it's been all of these years, I think I'm still continuing to find the complexity in that because then when you begin doing it, you're also to a certain extent dismantling the things that other people have been taught to believe over a long time. So it's laden with a lot of levels, right? So when you want to do something extremely truthful, that often, again, you know, I, I'm like you, Hamad, I'm sort of mining my own experience, right? But often my experience isn't representational of, of what people think the experience is, right? So there's a, a wonderful complexity in that, but also sometimes the challenge because, you know, the theaters that are that are programming your work are saying, well, you know, I don't know about the experience that some of the fellow writers here have had, but you know, I'm I'm often the first writer of you know Muslim descent that these people are are are, are programming, right? I mean, that's been the case for my, many of my productions this season. So a lot of sometimes well intentioned and sometimes frankly frustrating pressure is placed on like, well, you have to teach our audience about your community through this, and I'm saying like, I cannot. That is actually not my responsibility, you know. I can only speak from my own standpoint. So, it's it's both a it's an honor and a privilege, and sometimes still an uphill battle to do the work, only because I think our community specifically is still very much in a in a dismantling process of sort of how the the negative reinforcements have have contributed to the view of our community over many years. Thank you. Arti. So I, um, you know, really looking back onto like when I decided like, oh, this is going to be the career path for me, it kind of came a little bit earlier in the sense of representation. For me, growing up biracial, being um, half Arab, half Southeast Asian, and growing up in a really homogenous, mostly Arab, like partly South Asian Muslim community outside of Detroit, I felt that ostracization like immediately, uh, even though I went to an all Arabic school up until I was 13, there was just no concept of that, you know, again, dating myself back in the 90s, but you know, that doesn't, that it didn't really happen. Um, so I think that part of what drove me to the type of representation I'm drawn to now, which is specifically mixed biracial intersectional representation is because I want to be a beacon for other mixed Muslims you know, who maybe aren't half white and don't get to just like discard half of their identity to immerse in one culture. 
there's this idea of like halfness that we've been taught to have. Oh, like, oh, you're Arab. Okay, which side? Your dad's side? Okay, if not, then you're half, right? So I just wanted to be this beacon to let all these other mixed or multiracial people know that like you're not half, you're whole. You are you are lucky. You have multiple cultures to choose from. And like, don't ever let anybody treat you like you don't deserve a seat at the table because of who your other parent is which I'm sure a lot of people here can understand like the commodification of our race and our identities in this industry is like so hyper fixated on being like a single box. Like you got to check the single box. And if you don't, it's very easy to discard that person regardless of, you know, their talent or connection to the culture or heritage because, you know, there's somebody else, there's somebody else who could do it. Um, yeah, and I think that in an American setting, which is a lot of the work I do focuses on like American born Muslim, when you look at the statistics, you know, 40% of American born Muslims are black, 25% of American born Muslims identify as multicultural or mixed, but when was the last time you ever saw an interracial relationship or a multicultural Muslim that did not center whiteness? Like even in our stories that they, they, they got to be there. Why is the big question I have just why? Does anyone want to respond to that big question? As y'all are stewing over, thank you, Artie, for, for those thoughts. Um, yeah, I just want to really appreciate all of all of the stories that are being shared. Um, I'm, I'm getting a sense of this thread of, of course, a not a conflict, but a co-presence of personal individual particular life experiences, the sort of fight to be present as an individual, which I think members of the mainstream often don't have to fight to do, right? Um, they're often seen as individual first, um, and then also wanting to correct narratives, toxic narratives that already exist in particularly in American and potentially other Western uh, Hamad over in the in the UK, um, in, you know, in Western context, certainly post 9-11. Side note, when when y'all were saying dating myself or dating, I kept thinking like you are out on a date with yourself. <laughs> um, Aiza, please go ahead. Um, yeah, just to, um, Arthi, that was really beautifully said. Thank you for saying that, you know, and just to just talk about a little bit about identity. It's so complex. Like I'm not racially Arab. I was born in Saudi Arabia. I lived there for the first 12 years of my life. So very much embedded in Saudi culture, that was it. And I identify as Saudi, but because both of my parents are very mixed South Asian, uh, it's so difficult for me to sometimes navigate these spaces where even in theater, they're like, well, are you Arab? No, they, they, you, you're not allowed to come to this thing unless you are Arab. You can't audition for this thing. We're looking for Arab, you can't. So it's just like always, I'm like, well, but I do identify as Saudi more than somebody, you know, who's like fourth generation removed Syrian who grew up in America with a white parent. I'm like, how are you more Arab than I am? So I think the, and I do identify as South Asian also, and I do identify as Muslim also. I think we have to just kind of, we, we have to create a world where we're not policing other people's identity. We need to let people be able to self-identify with, you know, what resonates with them. And something I think that I would love to like hop onto that and and like kind of turn the direction back and toward the decision makers, right? Because it's not about who gets let in the room instead of or because of you. It's like who are the decision makers who don't have a complex enough understanding of of race and ethnicity and how they might overlap, right? Like I want to make sure that like every time we're moving forward in this conversation, it gets so easy to punch down and be like, well, who took my spot or who kept me from being in the room when it's like actually what Karim said earlier, a lot of these decision makers who are doing this for the first time, but they are the experts are the ones telling you that like, actually you're not Saudi, even though you were born and raised there, right? Like, so I think that we should be hyper, hyper critical of the people on top. Yeah, same, that goes back to what Kareem was saying earlier. You know, it's just like, sometimes people in places of power who are programming your work have a very specific lens that they see. So many times I've been told in feed, oh, would a Muslim person really do that? I'm like, yeah, bitch, I did it. I'm a Muslim person. <laughs> You know, so it's like, who is the person in place of, who's looking at your work through that? What is that lens that they're looking at it through? Absolutely. Um, 
Uh, Rihanna, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, want, I was just going to jump in on that in terms of, I mean, I guess for better or worse, like my work, my art has evolved to the point of like, I'm all, this is like, I'm like, look at here, look at here, look at here. And then I slide like my <laughs> politics of my work in under that um, because of, that's kind of just how I've learned uh, to be in, as an artist. And um, I was reading a quote from Ocean Vuong, um, a novelist uh, somewhere. And uh, it said that like, so, to paraphrase this really badly, but it said like so much work from people of color is looked at not for the art, but just for the like ethnicity of it. Like just so, so that it's like, it doesn't have to be like artfully good. It just has to like have a point of view. And it's just, that's to me like, not true but it is I feel like sometimes true from the gate like the quote-unquote gatekeepers or the powers that be or whatever mm -hmm. mysterious being programmed something in that causes irreparable harm as Kareem <laughs> was you know so I think um I think that there has to be a way to both yeah expand the gate and allow for that flow of voices through Matt, go ahead. I just wanted to very briefly just uh, second Artie's point about decision makers. I feel like uh, decision makers, people in power, especially in theater, they can select certain Muslims whose work they want to produce. And that's often reflective of what they want to hear about Muslims and what Muslim stories they want to hear. And Sometimes we can fall into the trap of blaming those fellow Muslims, but you know, fellow Muslims aren't the enemy. It's the decision makers. It's that there we need to put the spotlight on and understand that not everybody is going to reflect our experience of being Muslim, but there needs to be a representation of the widest variety of being Muslim and Muslim narratives. And it's on the decision makers. It's on us to put the spotlight on the decision makers to show and illustrate that variety in its fullest. Thanks. Yeah, I'm really appreciating what folks are saying about um, and what RT initially flagged about um, essentially systems of power and who holds the power right here. And these, the boxes Aiza, that you were describing in terms of having to be only Saudi or only a Muslim or only this essentially are created by the power structures that are in place, um, particularly in, in Western regimes of art production, right, which have been dominated historically by white patriarchal heteronormative Christian norms. Um, and it is, I applaud all of you for being in that space, for fighting back against that space. Um, and to also poorly paraphrase, uh, both Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde, um, your your existence is resistance. Your presence is resistance. Um, so I thank you for that. Any other thoughts about uh, this current question? If not, I want to go ahead and uh, pitch another question to y'all in terms of what can we do as Muslims to support one another's work? We we heard a lot about our individual stories, which of course are, are invaluable and important, but how can we reach out to other Muslim art makers um, to, to support one another? My Zoom screen is doing some things. Okay, there we go. Uh, Hanna, go ahead. Um, sorry, technologically <laughs> disadvantage right now. Um, but the I, I just wanted to shout out Arty actually because um, Arty did something uh, that I think was incredible. Uh, that they had auditioned for my play Hate Fuck for the Roundhouse, which ended up getting canceled due to COVID. And then single-handedly uh, took the play, put up a reading of it, made all the theater come see it, and then pretty much single-handedly produced it and directed, like got it into production and directed the crap out of it and just did like an amazing job. And was just like, this will not fail because I will not let it fail. And I think that level of passion and generosity and vision uh, is something that, 
I find remarkable and want to try to model myself after. So I just wanted to show that as like a model of like what can be done for other Muslim artists. And I appreciate it. So thank you. And I had the privilege of seeing the the fruit of RT and Johanna's work uh, recently, and and it's a testament uh, to the hard work and love that went into it. Um, Kareem, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is a topic I'm particularly passionate about because I think what I, my own experience of of so much of my career has been shaped by the fact that like early on I was sort of embraced by a group of fellow, you know, storytellers, uh, primarily in New York, you know, telling Muslim and, and Arab stories, and that sort of encouraged me there. So I felt like it's my responsibility to do that. And, you know, I, so as a result, you know, there, there are now, um, you know, a few years ago uh, at the dearly departed Lark, you know, let's all shed a tear, you know, for, for that. But, you know, with Munan Mansour and myself sort of creating a space for um, not specifically just Muslim writers, but you know Middle Eastern writers to um, to have a, a home. And now that group is continuing um, uh, at Playwrights Horizons. And I think what I've really come to notice that you know our community, particularly when you're talking when you're expanding it to sort of Muslim stories writ large, and we've already touched on that. There's a lot of like internal conflict and internal, you know, like debate as to like who holds what part of the story. And I think I I theorize, I I don't know this to be entirely true, but you know, that I think it's because of that difficulty in us speaking with a collective voice that I think our community has maybe not been as representative as it could be, as we see in some of our other. Um, you know, sister community, underrepresented communities. So I know that I, I like to take it upon myself to say like, okay, you know, I, I'm creating this sort of very specific thing that I am passionate about, but that's not necessarily going to be the thing that, you know, theater X over here wants, or, you know, this producer want, you know, but I could be like, oh, but you know what, have you heard of, you know, my friend Isa, or have you heard of, you know, my friend, Rahana, or you should really look at this play. And I think that it sort of behooves us to all continue to stay very engaged with one another's work and and promote it and celebrate it, which I think is like happening. I know Artie, you're really spearheading that a lot here in Chicago. And you know, I've we've newer theater has tried to do the same in 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 New York, and there's Monotma as as well that is doing that at a nationwide level. But I think the more of that that our community embraces, I think we're gonna start to see a proliferation of those stories because it, 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 I think we have, we started, we started later and we continue, I think for good reasons to rub elbow, you know, there's a bit of sharp elbowedness in terms of how we're going to speak collectively, which I think is vital to the community. But I think the more that we learn how to embrace that, um, I think a lot of good will come from that, you know, for all of us. Yeah, thanks for that, Kareem. Um, I have a quick follow-up thought slash question about that. Um, I'm also curious to hear everyone's thoughts about what kind of support you might receive uh, from the larger Muslim communities that you're members of. So not just theater communities, not just artistic create, uh, communities, but um, how has your experience been there and how have you been supported by, by your larger Muslim communities or how have you not and what are areas for improvement there? Here, I'll go first. So I think just um, in general, like showing up, because here's the thing, like we have a lot of um, amazing films, TV shows, all this stuff, right? Again, it may not represent my experience of being a Muslim woman in the world, but it is a Muslim experience. And I think sometimes in our communities, we love to hate on people. And we're like, why did, well, they showed this Muslim and this is all wrong. And I think just kind of moving away from that and being like, hey, let's celebrate this person getting this far all on their own and let's as a community support them because more work will not get created. It's, it's just, we have to show numbers. We have to show that the Muslim communities is interested in this TV show, in this film, in this play, and then more things will get commissioned and be put on the, in theaters or on the air. Um, so I think as just a general 
as a community, even if you don't agree with someone else's art, I think as painful as that is, <laughs> maybe we have to show mm -hmm. up and we have to support and we have to say, this is Muslim, it is a single story, we support it as a community. I, I, that, I don't know how to get our community to do that because I think people who are doing that are other artists at this point. We'll, we understand this point of view and we will support it. But I, yeah, I, I, don't, I would love to hear what other people think about that within our own community. Thank you, Aiza. Um, just a quick reminder for the audience members who are listening in through HowlRound, please feel free to submit your questions um, in the chat feature. Uh, Nadia, go ahead. I think one of the things that I found when I first started um, as an artist, both as a theater maker and as a filmmaker, is that there are people who are going to like champion you hard. And it's awesome to receive support support where folks are like able to be critical of your work and also be like I'm so glad you're doing this like keep going one of the one of the biggest experiences that has changed the way that I sort of make my art is um there's this Muslim film festival called the Moscars and they uh encouraged me to make my first film I remember at I Heart Halal Fest back in like 2019 RT was there as well um, we were at this booth, they were right next to me, and they were like, hey, you're an artist, make a film. If you want to work with us, make a film. And they encouraged me to make my first film. It got into the festival, and the the let me tell you, the sheer amount of support and championing that they have done for Muslim artists across both Canada and the U.S. and globally is amazing. So, like, organizations that that really are there to be like, we recognize you're Muslim and we want to give you a platform and we're excited to see the work that you do for our community, no matter what, like it's, it's really something amazing to feel supported like that. So uh, continuing to show up and show out is like definitely something that I, I would love to see more of in our community. I'm glad you had uh, such a positive experience. Uh, come back, go ahead. Yes, uh, again, showing up, uh, showing up in numbers. It'd be great to see uh, Muslims who show up for Friday prayers at the mosque, same numbers and the same people going to theater uh, and showing up for a Muslim play. I'd love that. And um, I think it's about inculcating a greater culture of going to the theater and engaging with the arts and um, and really even reaching out to insulated Muslim communities who've never gone to the theater before. And, re and trying to get those communities come out and really just support Muslim artists and Muslim artwork, even if it doesn't chime in with your own experience. Having said that, I, again, shifting the spotlight onto decision makers, I do think the emphasis has to be on theaters, on film production companies, marketing departments, outreach programs to reach out to Muslims, right? And again, reaching out to Muslims, not always the kind of Muslims you like, right? Um, not the kind of Muslims whose opinions chime in with yours, right? Um, but they are still part of the community, they're part of our society. And, you know, discounted tickets, uh, just letting them be aware of that this is happening, uh, making it a welcoming space and so forth. So again, I, I do think it's on the decision makers and it's on the people in power to really reach out to Muslims as well and help them and give them a space to really show up and feel welcome. So there's two questions I wanted to answer in there. And the first one, I think um, Isaac kind of posed of like, what can we do to get more Muslims like in our spaces? And like First Floor, this was the first Muslim story that First Floor has ever produced. So shout out to them for finally getting it done. Um, and because of that, I felt like they were really upfront in the fact that like, we don't have connections with these communities and we need your help. That has not always been my experience with other theaters. Other theaters will be like, well, this is how we market. This is when we market. This is who we market to. And people will show up because we are this theater company. But they were really, really great and flexible. Like Haman said, the decision makers were great about being like, yes, what do we, who do we need to reach out to? when do we need to reach out to them by which is a big deal because trying to get muslims to do things last minute that they've never done before like you're it's not going to happen so some one of the things that i did do and it's a line actually in rahana's script that like really rings in my ears every time i think about this conversation which is like you know i i want the support of my community a community that i've not been in touch with and you know he says what have you done to deserve that and he says i exist and that's just not enough, actually. So like, are we going into community centers? Like in Chicago, I went to Studio Salam. I reached out to Muslim Writers Collective. Um, not only that, but I reached out to individual 
um, organizations that were more like racial race race based like the Chicago Asian Network and I was like hey we've got this great all Asian cast um, and and production team so that we would love for you to like center our work. So it's not just about like expecting people to come because you've created representation but like are you going to mosques, even though it's uncomfortable for me to go to a mosque and stand in the women's section like. Are we meeting the Muslims that might not agree with our work, but like, can we get them in the spaces anyways? Um, and so I think that like, I really wanted to, wanted to put that onus again on the theater company because I don't think it should be the individual artist's responsibility. But when someone doesn't know what our community layout is, like the very least we could do is, is give them an overview of how to connect with these people and be willing to put our bodies, unfortunately, in uncomfortable spaces in order to make those cross-cultural connections. Um, yeah, and then I forgot the second question, so I'll cede my time. Thanks. If it comes back to you, uh, just let us know, Rihanna. Yeah, I, I um, jumping off of that, uh, of that hospitality idea. I think the space needs to be hospitable for Muslims to come share in the moment, and I find that uh, that a lot of that is on the theaters. Too, to make it a place um, where you make sure you you feel like you're welcome there, that you're not going to be under attack for being who you are. And I think a lot of that has to do with figuring out like, is this a good time right now for this performance? Or even as simple as like, if we're serving food here, do we wanna include halal options and even say it up front so that we know? And I think that sort of thinking through um, of like this generous, hospitality concept is something that is in the makings but hasn't quite reached to like each audience um, from theaters in a way that I would like it to be. And then secondly, in terms of like uh, how have like non-artist community have like impacted my work or I think that was the original question of like how, how that has happened. Um, I mean, I think for me, like early on in my career when I was running a theater company, and a, a fellow Muslim would be like, how can I help? This seems interesting what you do. <laughs> it's like, uh, I was like, well, what do you do? Like, what would you like to do? It's kind of a question back. And like, you know, I had a, uh, who now who became a friend, like, uh, was like, I do databases. And I'm like, wonderful. Could you send out an email for me? <laughs> to like to these people and like and fellow Muslims and like create a database for me. And like, that sounds really bad. <laughs> it's not bad. Um, it was for my theater company. And then like another one was like, I like building things. I'm like, would you consider building a set for me? Like to do like a show. And so um, things like that of like community involvement, it was how I've uh, created community outside of the artist pool um, of like, this is what I do. And I know it seems very different from what you do, but like maybe there are ways in which we can find overlap because uh, there are similarities already that we have as fellow Muslims. I don't think that sounded bad at all. I think that's quite genius. In fact, um, uh, as a creative person myself in, in a Muslim community, I know how uh, oftentimes it can be ostracizing or, or you might be seen as the weird one or you're off doing something and nobody really gets it. Um, and so I think it is very smart to connect with folks in terms of their own expertise and to show them that their work also can contribute to to the creative arts in, in these particular ways. On that note, I'll go ahead and kind of transition us into um, another question. I remembered my second oh, thing. Ahead. Can I hop oh, in? Oh, go ahead. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, the question was, what can Muslims do to support each other? And I kind of wanted to echo back to what Rahana said about um, two things. One, prioritize putting Muslims in your show. Like if you've got a Muslim show, let's get a bunch of Muslim artists. Let's make this room happen, but in real life. You know what I mean? Um, and one of the things that happened is that like Rahana, what she left out of the story is that I cold emailed her and was like, hello, stranger, it is me, a person with zero qualification, but could I direct your play because I love your play and I'm from the place where it takes place and it like resonates in my soul from top to bottom, right? And she took a chance on me. She, an established playwright, took a chance on me, an amateur. And this is an amazing response to what happened. And then vice versa, when I was auditioning for this role in the non-equity scene, like there was an actor who had been under study city up until this point, nobody had given him a chance, but he was Muslim and he was South Asian and he was perfect. 
And like, I decided to do the same thing. So letting that trickle down, like someone might not be the shiniest, someone might not have gone to grad school or have had all the credits, but like, if you want more Muslim work, put Muslims in the room. If you have that power, kick it back. They might not have been your first choice, but like, you never know what that ripple effect is going to cause. And like, honestly, Rahana taking that chance on me has forever changed my career and like my life. So um, I also want to be the beacon for other people to be like, hey, you don't have to have experience, whatever that might mean. If you're passionate about the work, you know that culture in your bones, you go do it and you figure out how to get it done. Ask for help. We're here. Sorry. You're going to make me tear up over here while I'm supposed to be moderating. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I second that and echo that in terms of uh, don't, I, I would encourage you to not look at what a person looks like on, on paper, because again, who created the system of the paper and the institutions that are giving these degrees and whatever qualifications. Um, so uh, with that, I do want to transition into sort of a resource-based conversation in terms of what resources might y'all suggest in for somebody who might want to move forward um, in producing more nuanced Muslim work. Um, and Artia has, again, uh, graciously volunteered to create a cumulative list that um, they'll post later on HowlRound's website. So if anybody wants to reference this again, please go um, and take a look at the website afterwards where this the recording of this conversation will also be posted. Um, a couple to start us off with are the Riz Ahmed test, uh, which I didn't actually even know existed, and I'm so grateful to know that it does. It's essentially the, a Muslim version of the Bechdel test, if you're familiar with that, which is um, representation of female characters or, or women identifying folks. But the Riz Ahmed test basically gives you five questions regarding Muslim representation, and if the answer is no, I believe to any of those, or excuse me, yes to any of the questions, um, you likely should not move forward with producing that particular work. You need to make some major changes before you do. And, and again, the, the link for the Riz Ahmed test will be provided on the HowlRound website. Um, if it does pass this test, um, or if you feel quite confident in what you're producing, uh, the Blueprints Pillars Fund um, has a lot of resources that can help you move forward with producing uh, producing this particular work. Um, there are also a number of theaters um, that support Muslim-centered work, and um, including Silk Road Rising, Golden Thread Theater, and Noor Theater, which I know was, was already mentioned um, during the conversation. So, if any of you have uh, resources or recommendations for particular institutions that you would like to um, direct people towards, that would be appreciated. I feel like we should create a list of Muslim artists, um, maybe even in theater, because so often I see big theaters, just like they work with the same five people, even if they're not Muslim, it doesn't matter. They'll just cast them in their plays about like, you know, a South Indian getting cast as an Afghani is just, it's silly. Why would you do? So it's just like that kind of resource, if it existed, I think it would be great. Wonderful, thanks. Kareem. Yeah, I mean, I already mentioned, I mean, I think you've, you've hit a lot of them, you know, the sort of hit, what I would call the historic theaters that focus on, on these stories, um, Silk Road, Noor, Golden Thread. Um, only because I think they need, I think it would be good to sort of steer more people towards uh, Manatma, which is an organization that has sort of a national national profile in terms of uplifting those stories. Um, so I think it's, well, you can look at Manatma, uh, the Middle East North African Theater Makers Alliance or Theater Alliance, I think is what the acronym stands for. Um, we don't have any sort of public online presence, but if anyone is interested in, um, the sort of new model of the, the Middle Eastern American Writers Lab, as it was called at the LARC, which is now called the um, Swana, Swana Makers. Uh, gosh, forgive me, it's like my own group and I, we, we've just cha recently changed the name, um, but I wanna uplift May Truhaft Ali, who's a wonderful dramaturg and um, playwright, um, who is uh, sort of co-spearheading the initiative with me in New York to create a drop-in space for um, um, Swanasa writers uh, to gather every month, uh, which we do on Monday nights at Playwrights Horizons. And it's uh, uh, unlike the lab at the Lark, it's totally open for any um, 
creator to come and drop in and listen and be a part of a community and to share pages. So anybody who is interested in knowing more about that, I would just say you can reach out to me directly. I'm happy to provide my contact information um, so that you can participate in that, which will start up again, most likely um, in uh, September. Great, thank you. I'm seeing a lot of hands go uh, go up, which is exciting to me. Um, I do want to flag the time. We have about about ten minutes left, um, so I'm going to request answers be about uh, one to two minutes, please, um, because we have a couple more questions we want to discuss. Um, Rihanna, I think your hand was up, but did you just lower it? Oh, I don't know. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, Artie, go ahead. Ah. So I just wanted to actually mention, in case nobody knew, everybody on this call and everybody who's Muslim who's listening to this call should sign up for the Pillars Fund. They actually do have a Muslim artist database, mostly focused for film, but please do sign up for that. Um, and then as well, I wanted to mention that the Pillars Fund has something called the Muslim Blueprint, which is the way collab collaborated in with Riz Ahmed on, that basically gives guidelines for producing Muslim work in TV and film. So that is something that would have to be translated for theater, but it is a resource that does exist. And a lot of these things, like, you know what the difference between a line producer and an artistic producer is. It's like, same thing, right? So we're looking at parallels in those industries using that resource. Thank you. Aiza. Yeah, just quickly, um, Islamic Scholarship Fund, which has been around for 10 years, they give funding to films. Their application deadline is open right now until June 12th. So if you have a feature, a documentary, a narrative short, um, there's also a specific fund this year for writers and a lab that's associated with this. So if for Eid and Iftar themed stories, and you have to be a Muslim writer, if you're interested in that, just go to Islamic Scholarship Fund. They're on Instagram and everywhere, and islamicscholarshipfund.org online um, and apply. Why? Amazing. Thank you. Come on. Uh, just in London, there's a Muslim theater company called Khayal Theater, K H A Y A L. Uh, they do great, they've been doing great uh, work for Muslims uh, for many, many years now. So if you're ever in the UK, if you, there's somebody you want to collaborate with, and they're a touring theater as well. So they might be doing work in the US, but Khayal Theater, uh, they tell Muslim stories throughout Muslim history, and um, yeah, there's somebody who do great work. Thank you. Um, I want to take a minute to present a question from the audience to you all that I think is a wonderful question to uh, sort of wrap us up for today. Um, this person would love to know what kind of dream roles or dream stories you would like to see for Muslims on the stage. Yeah, Arky, go ahead. I would love to see like genre specific work that has nothing to do with being like Muslim as as trauma. But like I would love to see like sci-fi Muslim work. I would love to see like a horror play that's about like Muslim work. You know what I mean? Um yeah, so high height stakes genre specific Muslim, all Muslim characters, but has nothing to do with our struggle or our trauma. Love it. Nadia. I'm going to echo that. Like sci-fi, absolutely. I don't know if y'all have seen Polite Society, but that is like exactly the type of work I have been looking for. Like it's so smart and it's so, it's, it's practically genre defying. And I would love to see something like that or like a queer Muslim rom-com. Like I'm here for it. I would love to see some lovely fluffy art that is made that centers queer Muslims. Agreed. Polite Society is amazing. And also, uh, I, I believe Nadia Manzur also made Be Our Lady Parts, um, which I recommend. It's a British show um, about an all, all female punk rock uh, Muslim group. Um, any other thoughts on this question in terms of dream roles, dream stories? If not, um, I want to go ahead and wrap us up for today. I, I'm sure all of us could could spend multiple hours discussing um, the very important things that we've been discussing today. Um, and 
want to offer my deepest gratitude for everybody who has been present today for all of your thoughtfulness, all of your insights, um, all of your vulnerability. Uh, truly, truly appreciated. Um, as a younger person, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think I would ever be in a space like this. So I uh, thank you, RT, for organizing this, um, and thank you everybody for for being present. Um, as a closing reflection question um, that I, I want to give all of you a moment to, to potentially answer if you have any thoughts, um, whose voices were missing in the room today, right? In, in hand in hand with our gratitude for being present today, um, there are voices that are not present as well, Muslim voices that are not present. Um, and what might we potentially do to invite more, more people in? Um, come on, go ahead. I think the most obvious one that stood out to me is somebody who's African-American Muslim. Um, inevitably, we're talking about over one third of the American Muslim community is African-American Muslim. And um, personally, coming from Europe uh, and spending almost a decade in New York and in America and being around Harlem and being around going to mosques where uh, African-American Muslims are very dominant and being around African-American Muslim leaders, I learned a lot about how to be a self-confident Muslim, right? Growing up in Europe, being a European Muslim, um, I think there was a lot of insecurity about how to be a visible Muslim and so forth. But I learned that, you know, I learned a certain defiance uh, from African-American Muslims. And I see that in, you know, artwork and be, you know, as a step forward, it's an ongoing conversation. It's not easy, but as, you know, as a, in the terms of the next step, that's, since you asked, uh, that's who would be missing. Yes. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yeah, um, Archie, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, absolutely. I was just going to say, I read a statistic that the Hispanic and Latino Muslim population is the fastest growing population in America right now. There's also a lot of trans theater artists that we could engage and we never really hear from that. So, uh, yeah. I mean, that's. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to mention, like, aside from, you know, being biracial and having biracial representation, there are like no East Asian Muslims here. Mm -hmm. um, not only I think is that like reflected about the attention of our community for like positive representation, but also like the, the ongoing like <laughs> the ongoing dehumanization of Uyghur Muslims in, in mm -hmm. China and how that is nowhere near on like the general Muslim radar compared to like to Palestine, which by the way, free Palestine, free Palestine, free Palestine. But you know, like it's just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't get brought up as much. And there are no East Asian Muslims here, even though there are so many <laughs> in the world. And I'm, again, I'm the curator of this, right? So it's like my circles, even someone who's in the community, my circles are so homogenous that it was tough to find people who are all available for this time frame from every single different community, right? So yeah, I just want to thank you for bringing attention to that and also say that like, yeah, I take full responsibility as the curator for not having our community properly represented in a panel about marginalized Muslims. We'll do better next time. Inshallah, yes, yes, absolutely. I have, I have faith in you. Uh, Rihanna, go ahead. Yeah, I think this is a, I mean, you start here and then you start, you can build. You can't start up there. So um, starting here is great. And I actually, what I realized is as a child of a Filipina mother and a Pakistani father, um, and my mom converted, I actually grew up a lot around a lot of converted spouses, you know, as a little kid um, and from all over the globe. And so I think I actually, appreciate that perspective as well because I think it's a really um, interesting one too that could be used in the future yeah I appreciate that I was I was also going to flag uh, converts essentially and the convert experience and how um, our sisters and brothers may or may not feel welcome in in spaces that many of us have been born into um, any final thoughts from anybody that they would like to share. If not, I again just want to express my deep gratitude to everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We are at the hour, so we do have to conclude. Um, and 
all audience members, please do check out the recording of this, share the recording of this um, on HowlRound. Um, and again, the resources that we've discussed will be there. Thank you so much for thank you so much for being present. Bye, everyone. <laughs>